All right, y'all, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thanks to everybody for joining. Um, everybody knows Derek, nobody knows me. I'm Dr. Latanya Washington. I'm board certified in internal medicine and pediatrics. Derek and I have history. We went to school together from like elementary um, all the right way through high school. Um, so that's our background. And um, he posted a video a few weeks ago talking about his experience with the coronavirus. And so um, we definitely wanted to come and give you guys information from a reputable medical source so that you can know what's going on with this disease and how it affects you, how it can affect your family and how it affects your community. So um, I really just wanted to talk to Derek and get more information about his experience uh, with COVID um, first of all, we can start just with the basics. Uh, so COVID-19, the scientific name is SARS-CoV-2, is a coronavirus infection that causes um, a viral respiratory illness. Um, it has several symptoms. It's spread by respiratory droplets, and it can cause people to get sick. It's caused a lot of folks to get sick. Um, looking at the numbers, I checked them out right before I came online. The number of cases in the United States currently is 823,786, and the number of deaths in the U.S. as of 7 p.m. today, uh, 44,845 cases. And so just to kind of bring that around, you know, on Sunday, we were looking at 40,000 deaths. And then the week before that, we were looking at 20,000 deaths. So it's been... Um, astronomical, the number of people who have died from this. Um, so we really just wanted to bring more awareness to everything that was going on. And then, so I'll let Derek kind of take over and tell about um, how he got coronavirus and just what his experience was like, what his symptoms were, and um, what it was like when he was in the hospital and what his recovery has been since that time. And then if there are things that are kind of pertinent, then I'll just hop in and kind of echo what he says. Okay. So um, I received a notice that I had to go to LA for a job, like right before basically everything hit. Like, so um, right before I left, we got notices that basically everything was going to be shut down over the weekend. So I went ahead and did the job and I went out, I looked for hand sanitizers, masks, everything was completely sold out. So I'm thinking, hey, I'm in pretty good health. I'm just not gonna touch anything. And I'm gonna be very cautious, wash my hands, try to keep my hands out of my face. So I got there and then it just got worse as far as um, them shutting down everything. Um, all the, the the stores and were closing and the restaurants were closing at the same time when I got to LA. So I got to LA, I did the job. Um, we were very cautious. And then on my way back, my um, plane was completely empty. It was probably about um, 10 people in there and like two people in first class. So uh, that's where I think I really got the virus. So I got there and I got home and I was cool for about five days, honestly, about five days. I did all the work, all my edits that I needed to for the job. And right after I finished that, I started getting a headache and my eyes were swollen. And I was like, man, these sinus, these gotta be sinuses because I'm not coughing. Um, I'm not coughing and I don't have a fever. Or anything like that. So I went out to the store that morning, and by the time I got back, I had headaches. So at the same time, I'm taking like Sudafed, Zyrtex, all these things to um, try to help the situation. And I would just get a sp splitting headache right in the front of my temple, and it would come like I would take Tylenol. My wife told me she was like, "Don't take." Advil or whatever, because the media was saying that only take Tylenol. Mm -hmm. So it would break my fever. And then 
a few, like three hours later, like clockwork, it'll be back. And then I have these massive chills. So I found some old antibiotics and I took some um, no. amoxicillin. No. And, <laughs> I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe that'll knock it out. Um, because I, at the same time, I'm in a denial at the, at the same time. So I'm like, okay, maybe this will knock it out. And then when that didn't work, I was like, oh, this is, this is not looking good. So Kiana kicked me out of the bedroom and I got in the uh, guest bedroom from there, thank God, because my fever would go up and then come down, up and go down. So um, I, I called the hotline. All, all the doctors on the line are saying no when you said you took antibiotics. <laughs> Everybody's like, no. <laughs> so my fever would spike and then it'd come down. So um, I called the hotline. And at the same time, my mom's calling me because she know I travel all the time. She's like, we need to go to the doctor. I'm like, no need to go to the doctor because these hotlines are telling you to stay at home if you think you got it, if it's bearable. So one day passed, two day passed, fever up to 102. It would go down to 98, go back up to 102, come to five days. And my cousin called me. She was like, how long have you had a fever? I was like, like five days. She was like, right. to the doc, go to the ER. Um, and the only reason I had not gone because the hotlines kept telling me to stay at home if you think you could bear it out. So by that time, the fifth day, um, I had a little shortness of breath, but it wasn't like I couldn't walk if I had to. So I walked. We, um, she, Kiana took me to the emergency room. And when we got there, it was like a ghost town. There was two people on the outside and they were wearing masks. And they told her to just wait in the parking lot until I was diagnosed or whatever. So I get in there, the um, waiting room is completely empty. And they gave me a mask and they asked me what I was there for. And I said, I think I have a coronavirus. So at this time, the first question they asked me, and I saw in some of the comments that they normally ask this, ask you this, but it still freaked me out because it was like, do you have a will and testament? And, you know, it came, it became real to me at that time. Like, basically, this may be my last time seeing the world walking into this building. Like, I may not make it out. Um, even right. though I felt, I felt that I was physically strong, and but I knew these chills were, like, very painful as far as, and these headaches were just very painful. So I knew I needed some attention. So I get to the ER, and they check my breathing. She puts me on oxygen, and... Um, they started asking me questions about had I been anywhere. And I was like, yeah, I just came from LA. And once I got there, they ran my vitals. They, my fever at that point, probably because I had just taken the Tylenol, was like 99, 98. Um, mm -hmm. By the time I got to my room, it had went back up to 102. Mm -hmm. So she gave me my IVs. They did all that. They did my x-rays. The doctor came back and he was like, yeah, you have pneumonia. Mm -hmm. like, so your oh. x-ray, so on your x-ray, it looked like you had pneumonia. Had you been coughing or anything during that time? No coughing, nothing. Mm -hmm. Like, I think early on, I may have had one or two coughs, but it was nothing abnormal. It was just like okay. a small cough. So um, he told me at that point, they were going to take me into the hospital, and I told Kiana, that she could go ahead and go home because nobody, no family could come in there at that point. So they checked me in, and um, I just had basically a very slight short, I mean, very, it was tolerable. It wasn't like I needed a res respirator or anything like that, but I did need some type of breathing as long if I walked like maybe 10 feet. Um, I would be short breath, or short winded, but I could catch I could catch my own breath too at the time. So once I got there, um, most of the I figured I probably had been seven days in the virus by the time I got to the. To mm -hmm. the 
our hospital. So the next day, my fever finally broke, like in the wee, wee hours of the morning, it finally broke. And as soon as it broke, I started having other issues, um, these bad stomach cramps. So the next day, um, my doctor came in and I was like, I told her everything as far as what happened. And she was like, yeah, um, it sounds like that's your IV, that's your medications and your fluid leaving your system. So they gave me something for that. I just know when I was there, I got several shots. And maybe you can help me on this. They also gave me shots in my, in my stomach. Yeah, so that was probably a blood thinner to prevent you from getting a blood clot in your legs. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Getting that every day. Um, and then my sister-in-law, she happens to be a nurse. She was like, she called me on face. I mean, she called me when I was there and she was like, well, um, can y'all give him the antibiotic? I mean, can y'all give him the medicine for malaria or whatever? Mm -hmm. And then it was, they say all that's new and they don't know anything about that as far as if it's safe or the side effects of it, whatever. So right. I was like, you're just going to have to, we're, we're going to treat you for pneumonia, which they gave me antibiotics, lots mm -hmm. of fluid and, and oxygen. And, you know, my vitals, for the most part, my heart rate, I remember the nurse also mentioning that my, um, what, what is it? My heart rate was mm -hmm. 50. Does that sound right? 50? Is that your heart rate? Yeah, your heart rate could be 50. I mean, you are an athletic guy. Like, you work out all the time. Um, so that doesn't surprise me that your heart rate is 50. That's what she was saying. She was like, well, it just depends on the average person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so Derek, just for some clarity, like um, this was, so you were in the hospital, was it like, it was the beginning of March or something like, was it around that time? Yes, it was like, okay. I want to say it was like the 13th of March. Okay, so mid-March. Okay, mm -hmm. so about a month ago mm -hmm. now, um, I, a couple of people were asking that question, like um, during what time? Because your sister-in-law was asking about the hydroxychloroquine medicine and um, a lot of, there's been a lot of media talk about it, about treatment. And so the truth is, is that that's one of the medications that they have been using to treat coronavirus, but it hasn't been studied, had not been studied at that point. And even at this point, there have been some small level studies that actually um, showed that that medication was not helpful in treating coronavirus patients. Um, in that study, the patients that got that medication, a higher percentage of those patients actually died. So, um, you know, right now we still really don't have any type of treatment for this coronavirus inf infection. The thing that we're doing is really symptomatic treatment. Um, and so I know that um, you had also mentioned that when you went to the hospital, you were dehydrated. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's one of the things I'm sure you were feeling pretty bad um, with the dehydration. And so when we say supportive care, that's what that means. So since we don't have any medication that can treat coronavirus, then we are giving patients supportive care, meaning IV fluids. Um, Derek got antibiotics because on his chest X-ray, it looked like he had pneumonia. And so there's um, no way for us to know if he could have had a bacteria cause of pneumonia on top of the coronavirus causing him pneumonia. So that's why he got antibiotics for that as well. Um, and then when you say antibiotics, that also uh, brings to mind the talk about azithromycin or z -pack, which is also one of the treatments that they have been giving for uh, coronavirus. Again, that medication also um, has not really been studied. And um, so we just really don't know if it helps or not. Um, in medicine, we like to be able to show that the things that we're doing are actually helping and not hurting. Um, so that's why you're hearing a lot of the doctors that are um, talking in the media talk about um, these medications. So um, that's in regard to treatment. And so Derek, how long did you have to stay in the hospital? 
So I was in the hospital. It's all like a blur too. Like basically, once when I was there, the day, my days were running together. So the next day, my fever broke, and then the following day, the doctor came in, and his initial action reaction was, of course, to try to get me out of there to have room for somebody else. So uh, he began, and he was like, "Hey." Yeah, your vitals are good. You're back to normal. Stand up. And he basically was like, we're going to try to send you home today. So mm -hmm. um, my sister-in-law was on the phone at the time, and she was like, um, that seemed a little too soon. So he, to me, it seemed that he under, he could sense her hesitation. So he put the thing on my finger for my um, oxygen level. Mm -hmm. um, and it started off at about 99 and I mm -hmm. took like, about um, five steps and it went down to like 95, mm -hmm. like four. And he was like, okay, well, we're going to keep you here another day and just watch you to make sure you're not going to have any uh, breathing issues from there. So they kept me another day and my vitals were cool. Um, the mm -hmm. nurse came and they had me walk around the room to make sure I didn't get short winded. And mm -hmm. I also would take steps or try to walk to the bathroom, do things like that to kind of build up um, my breath. So she walked me for about five, 10 minutes, and then they were like, okay, you can go home today. So mm -hmm. I, guess I was there for a total of about three to four days. Okay, okay. So um, I think that also brings up another issue. You know, one of the things that they talk about with this infection is that it can make you, your oxygen level drop down. And that's what we call hypoxia. And so that's why they were checking the pulse ox. You know, one of the um, the things that we've been seeing as um, as health professionals basically is that, you know, these patients that have coronavirus, when you look at them, they clinically look okay. But then when you check their oxygen levels, they're lower than you would anticipate them. So um, that's a major thing. Um, and my suspicion is that's why a lot of people are um, having um, more difficulty with um, more difficulty with recovery. You know, the hypoxia is really the thing and the lung uh, disease is the thing that really causes patients to have to be hospitalized initially in most cases. So um, that's really been something that uh, we've seen a lot. And then, um, so Derek, can you talk a bit, I know you said that your sister-in-law was, was on the phone and she was kind of being an advocate for you um, mm -hmm. and helping you through that. Um, can you tell them about what, like, were you able to have visitors in the hospital? Um, no visitors. Um, when I got dropped off, Basically, it was just nobody could come in but you. And, you know, it's a little surreal because, um, like I mentioned, I was having cramps. And I remember this in particular. Um, and I, it's, they always seem to happen late in the middle of the night for some high reason. And that also contributed to me, uh, contributed to me not wanting to eat. Because every time I would eat, as soon as it digests, I would get those cramps. So anyway, um, I remember just having to go to the restroom and needing a nurse assistant, a nurse assistants, and um, it would take them forever. So I was very frustrated about that too, but it was very chaotic because um, another nurse came in and she told me, well, someone just passed. So basically you could be on the floor and no visitors, and then they would, that's another thing, they would have to get fully clothed when they came right. into the room. So mm -hmm. basically they would have on all protect, protective gear and full body gloves, all that. So it would take them, like if I called a nurse, it would take probably about 30 to 40 minutes for me to ever see a nurse come. Um, and that process alone just took a long time. So. Basically, I was in pain and couldn't get the help I needed or the assistance that I needed. And then the nurse came in and she explained to me that, you know, somebody had just passed on the floor. So it was very kind of nerve wracking because, you know, people dying 
depending on where you are, left and right. Fortunately, um, I was um, South Fulton, um, Peachtree City, um, in that area. So the traffic wasn't as high, but basically it was just you. So when your spouse calls, you just got to have your phone on FaceTime to see your, to talk to your family or anything like that. But um, they're overworked and basically understaffed. And it's a lot of, you know, demand, as you know, uh, for yeah. nurses. So, yeah. yeah. So I think that's, you know, one of the things that um, I certainly wanted to talk about is that, you know, when patients go to the hospital, really any patient, not just the coronavirus patient at this time, but most hospitals are on lockdown. So they aren't allowing people to have visitors in the hospital. Um, so when you go to the hospital, you're by yourself. Um, so it's important that you have your phone, your charger to be able to kind of communicate with the outside, to be able to communicate with your family members. The other thing, my dog is barking right now. Um, the other thing is, is that um, really at this time, one of the things that I've seen in the hospital, it, at the hospital I work at right now, there are a significant number of patients who are in the hospital that we aren't even, even able to get in contact with their family members for whatever reason. And um, my suspicion is, is that, you know, now these days people don't always answer their phones when they don't know the number that's calling them. And during this time, during this uh, coronavirus crisis or really any crisis is really important that you answer the phone because if your loved one is elderly or if they're in a situation where they can't can't um, speak for themselves and as physicians and healthcare professionals we're calling the family members to try to let you know how your family member is doing um, then it's important that you answer the phone uh, sometimes you may not even know that your that your loved one is in the hospital. You know, imagine if they don't live in the house with you, uh, then you may not know that they're in the hospital. So um, th I think that's the case for the patients that we're having difficulty getting in touch with their family members. Um, I couldn't imagine having a loved one in the hospital and not being able to be there and be at their sides. Um, our family members are the patient's best advocates. They can tell you a good history. They can tell you, um, you know, what medications the patients are on, and they can speak on their behalf if uh, the patient starts to get to go south and starts not looking good. They can tell you, you know, what that patient wants. Do they want to have full resuscitation and be put on the ventilator? And if their heart stops, they want to have chest compressions and they, you know, those types of things, or is that something that, you know, they've talked about and they don't want those things. And um, because our ultimate goal is really to follow the wishes of the patient and of the family members when they're in the hospital. And so we really just want to be able to to take good care of people. I think um, also, Derek, can you talk about kind of how being in that hospital room by yourself, how it was kind of isolating? And Yeah, for sure. You know, um... I'm trying to think of the hospital I was at, but um, I was in a nice hospital and I had a lot of space and all that, but it's very isolated and, you know, it's really just you. Um, right. So it was a lot of reflective time um, as far as thinking about life in general and your family and, you know, thank God Modern day technology would uh, FaceTime. You could actually see your family, right, and right, support and the love that you need. Um, my goal, really, when I was there, you know, it was basically the opposite of how I am. Period. All I wanted to do was just sleep, and mm -hmm. you know, I had no energy. I didn't want to eat. I don't want to do anything, and. Um, my whole goal was to just feel better and get back to myself. So um, I was trying to do anything possible as far as making sure I drink lots of fluid and making sure I got up and walked. Um, it was very uncomfortable for me to lay down 
um, which probably worked in my favor because I see I hear now that um, what's happening was um, the mucus and all that clogs the lungs. So mm -hmm. uh, I said I said up just because it felt better for me, but I was at a um, forty-five degree angle um, watching TV and sleeping because it was just way more comfortable for me. But uh, fortunately, fortunately, I didn't have the mucus issue that a lot of people was faced with. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that was primarily because of uh, me drinking so much water mm -hmm. know, and flushing stuff out. Yeah. So, Derek, I saw one question on the um, the thread that um, they asked, how how long did it take for you to get your test back, your uh, the coronavirus test? Like, when they did the test for you, how long was it before the result came back? You know what? Um, they gave me my test the night that I went in, and I got it, like, two days later. Mm -hmm. So, two days. Yeah, you know... Um, I think initially that some people, it was taking them up to a week to get their test result back. I know for our hospital, a lot of patients were getting discharged before we even got their test back, uh, which I think, and we were just telling them to continue to isolate once they got home. Now the test, the turnaround time, depending on where you are, can be a little bit quicker. You know, we're getting some tests back within 24 hours. But it's important for us to know when patients are positive so that we can know the next step. However, if, for patients that come into the hospital with suspected coronavirus, then we are doing the full protective equipment all the way, all the way through. Um, and so, Derek, let's uh, kind of circle um, back and, and talk about, so you, during your recovery, I know you are, um, you work out a lot. Mm -hmm. And when, once you got out of the hospital, how long did you take off from working out? And then when you, when did you feel like you were back at a hundred percent, or do you feel that now? Um, honestly, it happened quick for me. When I got back, of course, I had to be um, self quarantined for. I believe they told me to be in my room by myself for seventy. I mean, seventy eight hours. Is that right? Before I could come out to outside of my room. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, once I did that, um, then I had to be basically, they gave me a number, well, they calculated 14 days of when I was infected mm -hmm. until when I can leave or whatever. But um, um, so they calculated 14 days from when you uh, first started showing symptoms. Right. Um, so the, I think the rule was 78 hours before 78 hours I could leave the room it's within the household but from that um I believe it's 14 days from your last um symptom free so basically right. as soon as my fever broke that day from that day is 14 days after that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um yeah. but I haven't been anywhere since then anyway but once I got back I was, um, I just didn't have any energy. Like I slept all day and my sleep pattern is still off now. So I may wake up at three o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. and be, so my sleep pattern, that's the only thing that hasn't gotten back, um, which to normal is my sleep pattern. But mm -hmm. I slept up all day and I was fatigued and I didn't really want to do anything. I wasn't motivated to edit on the computer or do any retouching. Um, mm -hmm. all for about a week and mm -hmm. then physically I got stronger maybe two to three days I felt stronger and I felt like I can um, my taste was coming back as soon as I felt stronger but I just decided to give my body a rest for a week and by that time that week was over I was really ready to start working out again um, okay. I felt physically able to and I felt like um, the energy, I needed that energy and I needed that rush to kind of build the, uh, my body again. And mm -hmm. I mentioned, um, when I had the virus, I lost like 10 pounds. Oh, wow. Okay. And then, so what about like, did, did your family members have any symptoms at all or did they pretty much stay healthy? 
No, um, they didn't have any symptoms at all. Um, like I said, as soon as my fever um, came, was repeatedly coming, I kind of isolated myself. Um, mm -hmm. I saw somebody ask me about smell and taste. Um, yes, my smell and taste of food was completely thrown. And that was one reason probably that I had no appetite. Um, my tongue was a sensitive, extremely sensitive to salt and garlic and everything just tasted tasted nasty to me. So uh -huh. um, the taste was a big issue too. Um, but yeah, they fortunately, fortunately, they didn't never got any symptoms. But that's another thing. Thank God, you know, uh, my wife was cooking for me and all that. They would just bring the food up, put it on the dresser and go back. So in the, mm -hmm. I in the aqua bowl at all. So okay. um, the time I could come out of quarantine, it was like, you know, I wanted some junk food at that point. And, uh, <laughs> right. So, right. Yeah. So um, for a lot of people who are on, you know, I think that a lot of people pretty much have a general understanding of what the preventive measures are. Um, hand washing, really. Um, <laughs> social distancing. Um, now wearing a mask in public and staying home. Those are the main things. Um, I can't tell people enough to wash hands. I feel like I've washed my hands so much. They're raw and cracking that, you know, because I'm washing my hands significantly more than I did before and using hand sanitizer at the hospital because, you know, outside you can't really find it. So I'm washing my hands repeatedly at home as well. Um, when we talk about social distancing, I think that for Derek, I think he did a really great job of self-isolating when he started having symptoms um, at home. So that is uh, one of the things. The other thing uh, is when they talk about wearing a mask in public, I've heard so many things about it. You know, initially they were saying, no, you shouldn't wear a mask. Now they're saying you should wear a mask. Uh, I am a fan of the mask. If you can imagine if you have something covering your mouth, then it keeps your respiratory droplets from coming out because you produce them when you're breathing, talking, sneezing, coughing, all of those things. So it's preventing all those things from getting out into the air. But then also, if the person you're talking to is wearing a mask, then they're doing the same thing. So it significantly decreases the number of respiratory droplets. You know, you can, it's, I know it's hard to find masks. People have told me they have them on Etsy. I know a lot of people are making their own masks. Uh, we have the medical grade mask. The one thing that I will say about wearing masks is make sure that you wash these masks if they're cloth, because if you keep wearing the same mask all the time, or if you're interacting with people who don't wear masks, then um, I think I have, I think I have a mask here. Let me just grab one. I had several friends who sent me masks. Um, and so I have this little mask. So if I put this mask over my face, but I'm talking to somebody who's not wearing a mask, then their respiratory droplets are getting on my mask. And so if I go home, if I'm touching this mask to take it off, then I'm pretty much whatever they said to me, all of their virus, if they have it, is on my mask. So um, that's why we say it's important that you wash these cloth masks uh, really on a daily basis. You know, get a couple that you can put in rotation and, and wash them all the time. Derek, I know I saw you posted uh, mm -hmm. a picture to IG wearing your mask. Mm -hmm. There are uh, people who are making masks all over. We've had a significant number of people donate masks um, to our hospital um, for some of the healthcare workers. What we do in the hospital is that sometimes we'll use the medical grade mask and then we'll put a cloth mask over the top to keep that other person's droplets from getting on the on our medical mask. So that's uh, one of the things that we've been doing. Um, and then staying at home, you know, that's um, that's the best thing we can do, really. Um, we've seen a lot of stuff in the news. I live in Tennessee, Derrick's in Georgia, two states that are talking about easing the restrictions on social distancing. Um, I don't know. What what do you feel about that, Derek? I have my own opinions that I'll share. Um, you know, it's very discouraging whatever, you know, like if I go to the grocery store, um, how people don't take it seriously. 
And already, like, I can count on um, two hands or even more of people that aren't even wearing masks. And they're just mm -hmm. pushing. And they have kids with them that's not wearing masks or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So it's one thing, really, we aren't abiding by the rules now anyway. So for the government or for, you know, <laughs> them that even tell us, hey, we're going to open up nail shops, this, that, and the third, that's going to even bring more people, more more infections and more people catching the virus because right. we're all not really abiding by the rules and taking things seriously. You know, if you go to um, any store, you'll see people that are close to each other. You know, God, you don't even know if I have coronavirus or whatever. Why are you like right up on my back or right in front of me? Nobody's right. taking the uh, six feet separation seriously. So right. I think a bad thing that honestly I feel like it's too early. Um, I feel like the best thing that I could say is use common sense. You know, right. Like, right. If, right. If it's something as far as going to the grocery store, distance yourself in general. Even if you got to work or you got to do something. You should be right up on somebody. You shouldn't be in the in the right. environment more than like a couple of people um, until we know what's going on. Because people don't right. know if you're immune to the virus. If you had it once, if you can get it again, you know. I he I've heard people say that they think like they had the virus um, in early December. About five or six people have told me that. Personally, like, oh, I feel like I had the virus last year. So, you know, the virus is too new for us to be really playing the guessing game. Um, until we right. find a vaccine for it, or if we until we find out um, the side effects of the virus and everything that comes with that, we need to precaution ourselves. Right. I totally agree with that. Um... So I was just going to say, you know, in my opinion, I think that we shouldn't be talking about easing these restrictions and opening up um, non-essential business and businesses until, number one, we can get widespread testing. You know, now there's still a significant number of people who have symptoms who aren't able to get a test. We also know that this um, virus is spread asymptomatically. So if we're in the nail shop, uh, how do I know that the person sitting next to me doesn't have coronavirus? Or how does that person know that I don't have coronavirus? Or the person that's doing my service, how, you know, how do I know that they're not infected? Because likely they hadn't been able to be tested. Um, that's one, that's the, the, the first major thing. You know, um, number two, um, you know, we have to, they're talking about these antibody testing. I watched the news earlier today and they were talking about antibody testing, which is great. It tells you if you've uh, been exposed to the virus. Uh, so that's, that's good to know. But one thing that they are not for sure of is how long you're immune to the virus once you have these antibodies. Um, they don't know how much of an immune response you have. Uh, once you have these positive antibodies. So there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, and then the last thing is that we don't have a vaccine. So there's no way that we can ensure widespread immunity of a significant amount of the population. So we really shouldn't be talking about opening up. In my opinion, um, these states that have chosen to ease the restrictions and have these non-essential businesses open, the people that work at those businesses are going to have a higher rate of infection, and the people who utilize those businesses are going to have a higher rate of infection. But then it's also going to trickle down. You know, our hospitals and um, health systems are going to be more strained. Derek talked about how when he was in the hospital, he felt like it took a long time for the nursing staff to come uh, to come to assist him when he was there. You know, we're already experiencing some shortages. So that's going to be made more 
difficult. We know there's a shortage of personal protective equipment. It's going to uh, impact that. Um, but then also not only the people who are working and the people who are receiving services from these businesses, but then they're going to take it home to their family members too. And they could also become infected. Um, so in my opinion, it's just too risky to consider it right now. So right now what I'm doing is I'm going to work, I'm coming home. And that's what I tell um, my family members, too. I say, look, if you don't have to go outside the house, then don't um, at this point. So um, that's my opinion on that. Um, I think that one of the things that we um, have also heard a lot about within the past couple of weeks is how coronavirus is disproportionately affecting people of color. Um, so I definitely wanted to talk about that a little bit. I know Derek in his um, original um, video, he posted about um, he felt like the reason that he did OK with the virus is because he was because um, he was healthy. And um, so that's certainly uh, something that we have to think about is how we can be healthier overall. You know, there are some things that we can that we can control. And I'll let Derek take the lead because I know I probably need to work out and eat better myself. And I know he's the um, the fitness guru. So I'll let you kind of take the lead on that. Um, honestly, you know, I haven't been sick since I got the virus, since I basically changed my lifestyle of eating and exercising three years ago. So mm -hmm. when I started feeling ill here, I was like, man, I never had sinus issues. Um, before that, I would have them seasonally. Every season came, I would get mucus first, uh, coughs, then a cold. Um, one of the things that I do is I drink, I try to drink a gallon of water every day. Mm -hmm. But I realized that water just flushes out um, all the excess mucus. So um, I never had mucus issues. And I really feel like that was probably the reason why I didn't really have a cough or have complications as far as the breathing goes, because mm -hmm. um, I just flushed that out and I don't intake a lot of sugars. Um, I'm not saying you got to go completely, no sugars, none, none, none of this. But me personally, I, uh, my diet is um, macro nutrition. So for those of you who don't know what that is, basically that's your in intake of your proteins, carbs, carbohydrates, and fats. Um, I'm very lean because uh, my diet is extremely lean. Um, so I don't have a lot of fat as far as um, I don't eat a lot of cholesterol, fatty foods, all those things that contribute to heart disease. Um, all those issues kind of went away. Beforehand, I would have dark circles under my eyes, acne, all that, changed up my lifestyle, all that changed. So it's really about, you know, mind, body, and soul, and just um, living a better you. So whatever your fitness goes, if you're vegan, and I get this, I guess, ask this all the time, am I vegan? No, I eat meat. Um, I eat high protein, lean meats like fish, chicken, lean ground beef, steak, or whatever. So it's not that we have to really give up the foods we love. It's all about preparation. Get you an air fryer. Mm -hmm. Cut the oils out. Don't cook with oils. Because all we're doing is just making our heart disease and diabetes and all those things that we're prone to. Of course, some of it's hereditary. Some of diabetes is hereditary. Right. A lot of it can be controlled by our diet. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's unfortunate because a lot of times we as a people, you know, we love soul food. Um, we love high fat foods and we indulge as a part of our culture. And I'm not saying that you have to necessarily give up all those things, but we as a people have to get physical. We have to exercise. We have to run. 
Um, one complaint that I have that everybody tells me, which I know my body, I, I, I always have. The first thing they say, don't move too quick. Don't take it too fast. Don't get back to exercising. That's mm -hmm. the wrong mentality to me, personally. Mm -hmm. Feel your body. Don't overexert yourself, but you should know your body. Don't right. go in there and work out to, you can't, you're blue in the face, but you want to get, you want to stay physical. You don't want the mucus to settle. Right. You know, and you know, what you that's saying? one of the things that Chris Cuomo was talking about. Were you about to right. mention him? That's what he said, to, is to remain active um, because that helps with the mucus and clearance and all of those things. Um, mm -hmm. So I totally agree with that. Yeah, I mean, it's very important because, um, you know, it's just, I didn't even realize this the other day. I One of the first artists that I worked with and got a stellar award for was BB and CC Wines. So I follow BB on um, Instagram, and I didn't even realize that he had the coronavirus. Right, right. I was watching his journey, and he was like, yeah, he was running every day. He was still doing everything to keep motivated. And I think his brother had it, too, and everybody survived. And mm -hmm. BB has to be like that age demographic, really, that's wow. dangerous. And right. he was just fine and just doing it. So, right, right. you know, I think, honestly, I feel like a lot of time we as a people, we have been the victim. We have been wrong in society, but we don't have to always be the victim. It's up to right. us to change the situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anybody could be like, hey, I don't have a gym now. You know, you could be creative. Like, I'm looking around at my garage now. Let me fill up these water buckets. Um, let me do what I can to stay active and find ways to be creative and be innovative. Right, so, right. You know, that's what really is going to separate us. We are always, um, as a people, we have always excelled and been better in, in sports, entertainment, or whatever. So mentally, we just have to make sure that we realize that and we do best for ourselves. Right, right. And then as far as the exercising at home, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of the apps are giving free um, trials right now so that you can do more exercise at home just so that you can remain active. You can always go for a walk in your neighborhood. Um, anything to keep active. I know, um, and for some people, for people who are older who may not feel safe going out or people who have um, may not live in a safe environment where they feel comfortable walking outside, you can walk around your house, you can walk up and down some steps, you can do whatever you need to do to be able to get that exercise in. So um, that's something that's um, extremely important. Recommendations are to do 30 minutes of a cardiovascular exercise at least five days a week. Um, I don't always do that. I'm not even going to sit here and lie. I need to do better, um, but I'm trying. Yeah, and another so, thing, too, is I wanted to mention, too, like when you're going to the grocery store, try to stay away from processed foods. Absolutely. You know, you know like Oreos, chips, all those things. If it's not fresh, you know, just, just try to stay away from that type of thing and get fresh foods that are going to feed the body fruits and vegetables and right. you know be active that's the best thing you can do because you don't want to come out of this situation in the worst not to mention um drinking and smoking okay. right right that's right very so the drinking and smoking mm -hmm. um certainly has a lot um, to do with it. You know, that the the preliminary studies on the numbers are showing that those patients, if they get the coronavirus infection, people who smoke or people who drink alcohol regularly, they tend to do worse. Um, so that's something that you can control. Um, I also wanted to circle back and talk about um, other demographics that they say tend to do worse, um, obesity, uh, which Derek just told you what you need to do to uh, start working on that. Um, high blood pressure, patients with diabetes, patients with heart disease, pretty much exercise and changing your diet can help all of those things. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about 
you know, they talk about health disparities and how African Americans are more affected by this coronavirus infection. Um, I just want to say that from a physician standpoint, a black physician standpoint, black people have had poor outcomes in regards to hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, maternal and infant mortality, you name it, pretty much our our outcomes are worse than our counterparts. And we really didn't think that coronavirus was going to be any different. Um, and so that's why as physicians and as healthcare professionals, we were pushing for them to release the demographics to say, you know, so that we can basically prove with numbers that, hey, this is affecting our community disproportionately. So the numbers that you're seeing of people who are infected as well as who have died from coronavirus with the numbers for um, minorities being higher, you know, if we pull the numbers for any of the other diseases that I mentioned, it's going to be the same. Um, and so that's really, that's really the main thing. So again, things that we can control, we need to control. You know, certain things we can't control. I think there was this myth early on that black folks can get this disease. That was a lie from the pit of hell. We are being affected and we are being affected disproportionately. Um, it's important that you advocate for yourself and for your family members. Um, there's also a term that's re that's been going around for many, many years, but people have brought it out more so recently. It talks about, um, it's called the social determinants of health. So it means that are there other things that are going on in your community and in your surroundings that are that could keep you from having adequate health care or adequate resources that you may not be able to overcome what your disease is, what your disease process is. And so, you know, some of those things are good and some of those things aren't good. You know, for some, uh, some African-Americans, they live in multi-generational households where grandparents, parents, um, and kids all live in the same house. That's not a bad thing. That's family-centered. But when we live in those spaces, then we can't socially distance you know we may not have the space in our homes to be able to do that also um we have to talk about you know certain people may be in essential workforce they may have to go to work they may not have an option um so that's exposure too because when you go out and you come in then you're exposing the people that live in your household um, you also have to talk about, you know, what if people have to take public transportation? I think that the news said that there were hundreds of New York public transit uh, workers who were infected with this virus. Um, people that were taking the subways and buses, they don't have a way to isolate. You're in the same space, sitting in the same space, holding onto the same rail that somebody else was before you. So you don't have a way to do that. Um, so that's when you're dealing with coronavirus and transmitting the disease but then also in other times you know we might live in a food desert where it may be five or ten miles to get to a grocery store and we don't have a car so then or the grocery store that's around the corner from your house might not have fresh fruits and vegetables and lean meats so then what do you do in that instance do you you know they eat what is available um and then i want to talk about also just a general distrust of the medical community. A lot of African Americans really have um, are distrustful of um, physicians. I think it helps when you have a physician that looks like you. Um, I have a privilege of um, being surrounded by um, other very strong African American physicians, but I know that that's not a reality in a lot of areas of the country. Um, so when when patients come in and they don't look um, and they don't, your doctor doesn't look like you, then they don't necessarily listen to that, to that doctor, or uh, they don't necessarily understand what that doctor is telling them to do. So that can also affect it. And then if people don't have a hospital nearby, you know, people that live in rural communities, they may not have a hospital in 25 miles, 50 miles of where they live. So then how do you get adequate medical care 
when you feel sick and shortness of and short of breath at home, you don't, you know, it's going to take you an hour to get to the hospital. You might not have an hour. And I saw somebody on the thread asked about people dying at home. Um, so that kind of speaks to that if you live far away. And from my understanding, you know, really this coronavirus infection, when you start to have shortness of breath, then it will really take you out quickly. Um, so they may not have an opportunity to get to the hospital. Um, so I, it looks like IG is limiting our time. It's telling me we got 15 seconds left. So Derek, I'll let you go ahead and take us out. Thanks to everybody for joining. Yeah, so yeah, I just want to say thank you guys.